Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I trust you enjoyed yourself yesterday evening, and if you went out for dinner and drinks afterwards, uh, a few people might have gone out for drinks afterwards. We're a little bit down on numbers, but that happened on day two. Uh, welcome back. Um, an excellent day yesterday. We're, uh, we're hearing good things from around the place. It seems that you're all enjoying yourself. I'm really pleased to see that most of the ties have disappeared. Um, there's hardly one in the room now, which is, uh, which is fabulous. And if you do have one, just do that, and that way I'll be happy. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping matters, if I can, and then I'll hand over to the panel this morning. Um, some of the ones are repeat from yesterday. Uh, if you can, turn off your mobile phones. That would be great. I think it was yes yesterday, the first 90 minutes, I didn't hear a single phone in a room with over 400 people, which I thought was just fabulous. Uh, it doesn't happen in our lecture theatres, let me tell you. Um, commission meetings, just a few things around the commission meetings. If anyone's planning on attending the Sustainable Construction Roadmap meeting on Thursday, uh, could you meet at the CIB stall at 10.15? That's during the coffee break, just for two minutes so that we can get a handle on who's coming along. Um, TG81 Global Construction Data is now going to be held in P1 at 12 o'clock today. Everyone is welcome to attend that. These things will be on the notice board outside, by the way. The W96 Commission meeting, Architectural Management, that was scheduled for Thursday, is now going to be held today in P4 at 12 o'clock. Um, and the W110 Commission meeting is going to be held in M1 today at 12 o'clock. Other Commission coordinators, if you're um, still scheduled to do things on Thursday back on QT campus um, and you're planning on changing that, we need to know your final details if we can by close of Congress today um, because we need to finalise catering and room bookings. So if you can uh, let us know by the end of the day just through the registration desk if you're planning on not needing the room on QUT campus on Thursday, let us know, that would be fantastic. Just a reminder, of course, there is a notice board straight outside. There's uh, more and more sheets going up all, t uh, all the time as these sorts of things change. Please keep an eye on that. And for those that weren't here yesterday, the Wi-Fi access is free. Just select the BCEC link. Um, I'll hand over very shortly. Um, through the day, of course, we have a keynote by Brian Krauss at uh, one o'clock back in this room, that one's starting at one, um, beyond the panel meeting this morning. And there is nothing formal this evening. So this evening's at your leisure at the Congress, cro cl Congress close. Um, so uh, please enjoy yourself around Brisbane, see some of the sites if you get that chance. So let's get started this morning. Um, I'll hand over very quickly to Professor Keith Hampson. Keith is the CEO of the Sustainable Built Environment National Research Centre and he'll be hosting and chairing the panel session this morning. Keith. Thank you, Steve, and uh, welcome to everybody on the second day. And of course, uh, I trust that you've uh, enjoyed the Queensland wine, the Queensland beer, the Queensland fish, the Queensland beef, and the Queensland hospitality. So, uh, but I do notice that there's a few empty seats here, so I'm sure that there's going to be a few more uh, coming in this morning. This morning's session, uh, I want to say, um, you know, if I'm not only slightly biased, is it going to be a terrific session, uh, hearing from four uh, leading people from across the globe on the role of uh, research and development in construction. And before I started, I just wanted to um, set a context uh, to this, if I don't mind uh, for the, um, if we can just run the first uh, couple of slides, thanks. Okay, so uh, the impact of research and development on construction and the, uh, just say that the genesis of this theme has come from Sustainable Built Environment National Research Centre's uh, project called Leveraging R&D for the Australian Built Environment. Uh, the core members of our centre and an ARC linkage support from the Australian uh, Government. But importantly, in respect of the CIB, we also have formed a, a multinational task group called R&D Investment and Impact, coordinated by uh, Amina uh, robinson Fayak out of Alberta and Judy Kratz out of QUT with support from Adriana Sanchez here uh, in Brisbane through the Sustainable Built Environment National Research Centre. Our partners across industry, government and research around the country are shown there with uh, what Peter Verwa calls the logo soup of the TG85 group internationally. Um, it's a terrific group of organisations and more specifically individuals who contribute to this at a global level. Um, this morning, um, I'm delighted to um, 
uh, confirm that we have Professor Ian Chubb, Chubb the Chief Scientist of Australia, Carol Legall, uh, Professor Peter Barrett from Salford and Professor Lynn Beasley, the Chief Scientist of Western Australia, as forming part of the panel. But the important uh, duty that I'd like to call on John McCarthy to perform right now before we start the formal panel session is to launch a book, a very important book called Investing for Impact. And um, I guess John McCarthy is a man who needs uh, very little introduction. You know that he's the current president of the CIB. He's a recognised uh, global leader in property and construction and champions uh, improvement in the industry through cooperation, research, education and innovation. Please welcome John McCarthy to the stage. Thank you, Keith, and good morning, everyone even if I do come from New South Wales and not Queensland. The board of the uh, Sustainable Built Environment National Research Centre, along with its senior management, is committed to improving our industry. SBENRC is a key research broker between industry, government and research organisations serving the built environment. It is critical that we understand how research and development impacts on the built environment. Now the publication, Investing for Impact, draws together research findings and case studies from CIB Task Group 85, members across the globe, highlighting their diversity and similarities. The evaluation of international case studies on the role and impact of R&D on national development has allowed us to demonstrate examples from different sectors of the built environment of R&D investment models that provide a return on investment and other benefits for companies, government and the general community. I sincerely thank the task group 85 members who provided case studies for this project, their contributions from individuals and organisations who strive to make a difference. This is essential and if we are to deliver the benefits, we cannot do it without these contributions. I'd now like to uh, introduce to you Professor Ian Chubb, Australia's Chief Scientist, who will say a few words and officially launch investing for impact. Professor Ian Chubb took up his appointment as Chief Scientist of Australia on the 23rd of May 2011. Prior to this he was Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University for a decade as well as several other leadership roles in higher education. In 1999 he was made an officer of the Order of Australia and in 2006 a companion for service to higher education, including research and development policy in the pursuit of advising the national interest socially, economically, culturally and environmentally and to the facilitation of knowledge-based global economy. Would you please make welcome Professor Ian Chubb. Ladies and gentlemen, I guess as Australia's Chief Scientist, I should say by uh, way of beginning that I hope you joy enjoyed Australian fish last night, Australian beer, Australian wine, uh, but I also know where I am. So I hope you enjoyed last night. Um, thank you for inviting me today to uh, launch Investing uh, for Impact. The built environment industry uh, delivers vital in infrastructure that is, of course, a foundation for the uh, global economy. And here, research and development will play a, a crucial role, and I'll talk about that a little later in my next uh, appearance before you. But knowing how and uh, with whom and where to direct that uh, R&D is a challenge being faced by countries around the world. And as you do the sort of job that I've got, and indeed the sort of job that many of you have too, um, you realise that many of our challenges that we confront in this world are similar and that there are great opportunities uh, uh, to learn from each other. 
and investing the, uh, for impact draws together research findings and case studies from 14 countries and it highlights both the diversity and uh, the similarities and of course some of that diversity uh, gives us uh, insights into how to do things better uh, when we're at home, as it were. It's hoped that this research will help investors better match funding strategies to industry needs for a stronger and more productive built environment industry. So the key themes in the uh, report are productivity, of course, energy efficiency, sustainability, information and communication technology, small to medium enterprises and research and development and how to link them and collaboration. And it's the latter, the co collaboration between and within government, researchers and industry that's the key to successful R&D and innovation these days. The role of the uh, Sustainable Built Environment National Research Centre is critical in leading Australia's construction industry forward in a way that will drive input through property design uh, and construction in an integrated way. So I want to take this opportunity to wish the centre well in its most worthwhile goal of maintaining the valuable applied research service for Australia's built environment industry. Investing for impact has been developed following significant industry input and collaboration, as these reports should be, especially if they are more than just reports to please the writers, but are reports that actually have an impact. So congratulations to the uh, centre and members of the task group 85 for your hard work and dedication in developing this worthwhile publication. So it gives me great pleasure to launch officially Investing for Impact and I thank you and I hope you have an enjoyable Congress. Thank you. Thank you Ian and uh, thank you of course to uh, the co-authors uh, in Judy Kratz, Adriana Sanchez and Naomi Heron but of course all the members of Task Group 85 from the CIB. With Ian still standing, um, I wanted to now to move on to the main part of the panel discussion this morning. Um, and that is uh, where we'll have each of our panel members talk for seven or eight minutes, um, one after the other, with a view that uh, we'll open up the question and answer session towards the end of this um, session, where I will moderate up till morning tea time. So I'd like, in that context, to hand back to Professor Ian Chubb. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Keith. Ladies and gentlemen, as Australia's chief scientist, I suppose I should begin by saying I hope you enjoyed Australian beer. Uh, <laughs> hope you enjoyed Australian wine. <laughs> hope you enjoyed Australian fish last night. But I know where I am, and uh, and it's Australia. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you appreciate the role of science in our everyday lives, that nowhere has the impact of science been more obvious than in the development of our cities and our suburbs. The construction industry affects every Australian, our homes, our workplaces, our schools, our hospitals, our water supplies and indeed a great deal of what we do. The industry is also the fourth largest contributor to our gross domestic product and it employs almost 10% of Australia's workforce. And all of this is dependent on the strength of our construction industry and the science that underpins it. So I remind people that it's physicists, engineers and chemists that have contributed so many of the advances in construction that we take for granted today. The ability uh, to erect skyscrapers 150 or more storeys high. The development of buildings resilient to natural disasters like earthquakes and flooding. The ability to conjure computer visualisations of buildings and plans. The ability to build over water or on soft surfaces and probably even in space or certainly even in space. And it's not just applied research in typical construction disciplines that contribute to the industry. Increasingly, what some people might want to call or label more obscure areas of basic research are being found to have applications in construction. So, for example, bullet trains in Japan are designed on an understanding of the hummingbird's aerodynamics to reduce noise. The incredible water repellents of lotus leaves has been applied to aeroplane coatings and exterior paints to repel rain and keep surfaces clean. Even studies on the bumps on the fins of the humpback whale when applied to aeroplanes and submarines have shown to reduce drag by 32% and improve life by 8%. But R&D isn't always directed to new technologies or materials. Innovation in organisation, operations and processes can have just as much impact. 
it is estimated that even a small productivity increase of about 0.3% would result in an improvement of GDP of some $6.5 billion. And these numbers, are, these numbers are double that of any other industry. So it came as a bit of a surprise uh, when total public spending on construction R&D took a hard hit in the early 1990s, falling from 2.2% in 1992 to 0.5% of total government R&D in 2010. And when the funding began to evaporate, at first the sector was surprised, probably shocked, rightly so. But it showed resilience and during the same period, business expenditure on R&D increased almost exponentially, more than compensating for the decline in public investment, injecting five times the amount of government investment. Now, since the, co the closure of the Cooperative Research Centre in 2010, the sector faces a new challenge. So the key question is, how do we leverage the significant investment and achievements made through the Cooperative Research Centre once it is closed? And there's no easy answer as you'd expect, but this centre is one of the few examples of success. So strong R&D is dependent on nationwide collaboration between all parties, of industry, of government and of academia. The CRC and the strength the sector has shown in the face of such significant funding changes have developed a strong foundation for such collaboration. But it is a difficult transition once funding for a cooperative research centre has run its course. And unfortunately, regardless of the level of investment and collaboration, still less than 1% of construction businesses, businesses in Australia conduct their own R&D. It's probably not a surprise since 94% of our industry is comprised of business with five or fewer people. But by neglecting to conduct our own R&D, we not only reduce the chances that we will discover new things, new ways of doing things, develop new inventions before our competitors, we also limit our abilities to accept and use these new inventions that are developed elsewhere. To be internationally competitive requires technology, development and innovation. It is research and development that will create smarter construction operations, processes and techniques and as research and development that will help ensure Australia's place in a competitive global economy. So with this in mind, we need to ensure that we have a national approach to our R&D system. And that's one of the reasons why I'm preparing a national science and technology strategy uh, for our politicians. A core part of this strategy will be fostering collaboration between industry, government and academia. So specifically, we'll look at forging new and reinforced links across publicly funded science and industry catalyse innovation, particularly in areas of research strength and commercial potential. We'll increase the sharing of knowledge through two-way two staff mobility and we will explore creative public-private partnerships to bridge the gap between research and development, which is something that has bugged this country for a long time. So our advances in construction would not be possible without science and the future of construction will rely even more heavily on R&D as we see a push for sustainable buildings and pressure on urban systems as the population increases. A national strategy that improves links between science, industry and academia will guide our country towards greater innovation and ensure we continue to be internationally competitive. As one of Australia's most valuable industries, we must support construction R&D through strong links and through strategic planning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian, for uh, what is a, a strong national perspective in terms of the importance of R&D in this country and uh, reinforcing the need for uh, increased uh, investment for society. Our next speaker uh, is this morning is Carol Legall. Carol has been the director, sorry, the um, director general of the CSTB, which is a scientific and technical centre for building in France since 2009. The CSTB is the French public organisation for innovation in building established to address sustainable development challenges in construction. It performs four key activities, research, expertise, evaluation and dissemination of knowledge. Carol has extensive experience in research and expertise in management and in project developments ranging from local to international partnerships. Prior to joining CSTB, she was the Operational Director for Energy, Air and Noise uh, at the French Agency for Environment and Energy Management. She's a member of the CIB board and a co-chair of the Sustainable Building Alliance, 
a board member of the French Standards Association and co-chair of the ISO Strategic Advisory Group on Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Please welcome Carol. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when Keith asked me to speak in front of you on the impact of uh, R&D on construction, I was uh, both honored and worried because, of course, uh, R&D has a strong impact on construction and I could provide a lot of examples of innovative buildings and innovative materials or innovative construction process. But the actual uh, question that worries me is will R&D have sufficient impact on construction in the, in the fast coming years? So that's the main question I want to share with you today. I'm a little embarrassed to come to share more questions than answers, uh, but that's also the way science progresses by asking questions. But before we share questions, we need to share facts. And the first fact I want to share with you is that Brisbane is a wonderful city. <laughs> I would like to thank Keith and John McCarthy, the president of CIB, for offering me the opportunity to discover this beautiful country of Australia and the wonderful people of Australia and the great wine of Australia. <laughs> yes, and I mean it. The second thing I want to share with you and that we know for sure uh, is that the planet is facing big issues. Climate change, growing and aging human population, economic downturn. And we know that the construction sector is key to tackle all these issues. In most countries in the world, the building sector is the first service needed by the population. It's the first job provider, but it's also the first greenhouse gas emission source. So in all countries in the world, we want it all. We want more interesting jobs, we want more sweet homes, and we, le we want less environmental impact. So can we do that? That's one big question. So maybe let me quickly present CSTB. Keith uh, already did it a little bit. I'm the CEO of CSTB. CSTB is the French Building Science and Technology Center. We are a collaborative platform for innovation in sustainable construction. That means that we work for all the building stakeholders and we provide research, expertise, third party assessment and knowledge, of dissemin uh, knowledge dissemination. We are strongly connected to our uh, European research partners. We partner in more than 30 uh, European uh, funded projects and we provide the secretariat of ECTP and E2BA, which is the European Construction Technical Platform and the Energy Efficient Building Association, which are associations that bring together more than 200 companies and organizations and which work with the European Commission to provide what we call the European Research Roadmap uh, for Sustainable Construction. I'm a little bit of advertisement here. I will make a presentation of this roadmap this afternoon at 3.30, room M2, so please. At CSTB, since 2010, we reorganized all our research priorities by addressing these key questions, these key impact questions, and we start from the questions that we ask to the R&D. So in green, we have the first set of questions which we call the human scale issues. How do you go from sustainable material to sustainable buildings and sustainable buildings to sustainable cities and vice versa? In orange is what we call the we want it all issues. How do you integrate all these key public policies of safety, health, environmental protection all together in the buildings? And in red, of course, the better and cheaper issue. So I will start with the one example of questions. Are, building, are green buildings really green? To tackle this question, CSTB recently operated one big data collection to assess not the design building environmental performance, but the real building 
environmental performance on four key indicators, energy, carbon, waste, and water. This is a, what we think a premier initiative, and we carried out the LCA on um, 74 um, uh, buildings, real buildings, and we also measured the indoor air quality. And thanks to this study, the French markets now get the first initial idea of the magnitude of the benchmark for these environmental uh, indicators on real buildings. This initiative used the same uh, key performance indicators that we identified as operational priorities at CSTB, as, as SB, excuse me, that we um, uh, identified also at the international level in the uh, with the SBA, the Sustainable Building Association. And so the same kind of uh, assessment is now being done also at the international level in Finland, in the Czech Republic, in Spain, in Germany, and the, in the US. And the, the leader of these two projects at the national level and international level at CSTB is Julien Hans, who is attending the conference, who is here. So you can ask him a lot of information if you want to know more about this project. And he's the daddy of uh, Elodie, uh, who is the so which is the software we use to, to compile with all this big data. I'll try to go faster on the next questions. But for another big question for us is, are sustainable buildings really healthy? And we know that the indoor air quality tem tends to be worse than the outside uh, outdoor air quality. So it's not easy for uh, inhabitants to really tackle this issue and assess their own air quality. So we developed Loom Air, the, a device that is analyzing real-time indoor air quality so that, for example, school teacher can adjust the, the air quality of their school rooms and we'll see that Peter will explain that it is important for our kid education. Classic question, are sustainable buildings really safe buildings? As new materials are developed and new construction system are designed, as we want cheaper solutions and lower environmental impact, can we, make, can we still make sure this is really safe? And we developed a world-class testing facility for fire testing, for fire resistance of big scale structures. And this facility is open to private or public partners who are interested in uh, using it. Can IT help? <coughs> CSTB provides uh, softwares that make, make it easier and cheaper to design and assess buildings. I could give a lot of more examples, and I'm sure that all your organizations and, and universities have also a lot of success story to tell. But I'm back to my first question. Remember the big expectations? Compared to the results and the, <coughs> the investment, both public and private, that we in each country uh, do in the building sector, it seems that it's less than 1% of the GDP of the construction sector. So I'm asking the question, is that enough? For me, it's a big paradox, and I would answer my personal answer is no. Uh, at that speed of R&D investment and dissemination, I don't think we can reach uh, the success regarding the big stakes that are in front of us. But I have a proposal. I think together we can achieve more by sharing more. So we, we can work together at the international scale and, and share more and get more value from that. So we have to make the best of CIB. So my answer would be, my proposal would be, yes, we can. Can't we? Thank you. Thank you, Carol, and uh, posing some questions as well as uh, some answers there. Thank you. Our next panel member is Professor Peter Barrett. 
Peter's Professor of Management in Property and Construction at Salford University in the UK, where he's the past director of Salford's top-rated six-star research institute for the built, uh, the built, environment, built and human environment. He was the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Studies from 2001 to 2008 with responsibility for all research across the university. Peter's undertaken a wide range of research and is currently focusing on the themes of senses, brain and spaces with a particular interest in the area of primary school design and achieving optimal learning spaces. Peter's the immediate past president of the CIB. Thank you, Peter. Morning, everyone. Just got to work out how to do this. So what I'm looking at is, of course, the impact of R&D on construction. Um, but I'm going to focus not so much on what and how, and more on why. Why are we doing it? What are we trying to achieve through that? And I'm going back a long way, really, to just point to some results from James Powell, an old colleague of mine, and many of you will know him. He used Kolb's learning cycle to say, what are the learning styles of people in construction? And they were a bit like in the bottom right-hand corner there. And um, I did a, a very simple thing. I just put them together and said, so do they actually complete the learning cycle? And it turns out they don't. There's a gap. And the gap, I guess, is um, something where somebody else needs to make an impact in input. And in my mind, it's a gap where reflection has to take place. And that's something where researchers, um, I think, can make a very valuable um, contribution and complete that learning cycle. So what can researchers offer? Um, I've got a list there. I'm not going to go through it. Um, there are, I'm going to highlight a couple of things. There are some funny things about researchers. They generate knowledge and they want to transmit it. This is a strange thing in business. You don't actually find out something really important and give it away. Um, but for academics, that's what we try and do, isn't it? And in a sense, that's a brilliant thing, um, a very important thing. Another thing is that you actually think you're going to find something out and find out the opposite, and you don't mind. You actually think, oh, that's good. That's really interesting. Whereas in business, I've been in business, um, it's really upsetting when it doesn't work out how you expect. So researchers have a peculiar perspective. They fill a gap in the learning cycle. By my calculation, there's about one researcher for 10,000 people in the industry in the UK. So actually, they must do this funny thing that researchers do. If they don't do it, nobody else will. And there's nothing good about them all turning into practitioners. Being different is good. It's complementary. It actually provides a very important input. In terms of research impacts, for those not from the UK, this is our research council's um, pathways to impact. And it's just to say, they don't half expect us to do a lot of things, um, but some of it's to actually improve the academic base, some of it's to actually make e economic impacts, some of it's, a lot of it's actually, to make social impacts, and finally, they just about remembered um, environmental, Im environmental impacts at the top right there. Um, but in broad terms, it's a matter of making a contribution to a sustainable society. And um, we're talking about environmental, economic, and social impacts, the whole package. So, if our research is to actually make a contribution, the question would be, I suppose, is it about doing things right? And the picture at the bottom there is showing some construction workers gainfully employed in Manchester. Um, and actually, it was in Manchester, and the sun was shining, so I don't blame them for lying down and enjoying it. And, um, of course, it would be good to have a more efficient construction industry. I'm not doubting that, and, of course, it's very important. But it's just a means to something else, really, isn't it? It's just a means to improving the built environment, to actually providing shelter for people, to do it in a way that isn't um, going to cause tremendous problems to the environment. So I guess my argument would be, yes, let's have a better construction industry, but it's a means towards a better built environment. But that in itself isn't the end, really. That's a means to a better society. The built environment isn't there as a, as a thing to actually have just for fun. It's there to actually support people um, to be uh, more successful, um, both individually and collectively. So there's an argument there, I suppose, which is a bit insulting to construction, which is that construction is a means to a means to an end. And I think we should actually accept that. I think we should think about it and take that into account when we're focusing very much on our own particular area. If that's the case, there is a hitch, and the hitch is that that might be the end we're moving towards, but actually there's a very, very limited understanding of the holistic impact of spaces on people. So this isn't to say we don't know a lot about air quality, about temperature, about acoustics, 
All those things are very well studied, but if you actually ask people what's the effect of this whole space on the people in it, there's hardly any evidence at all. And if, if you know about it, then please tell me, because I've been looking hard for quite a long while now, and there is hardly anything out there. That's really problematic if you're actually trying to create a better society through a better built environment via a better construction industry. And it calls for a need for much more evidence about holistic impacts, much better understanding about how spaces we create really affect people. And if we don't have that, then it's very hard to actually orientate what we're doing. So it brings me to a, a phrase which some friends of mine from Alborg University said years ago. They said it's not about doing things right, it's about doing the right things. And if you're doing the right things, by all means, then do them more efficiently. But until you're doing the right things, um, maybe you're wasting your time. So what would that be worth if we could actually take that orientation? Well, we know there's a very much an aging population, certainly in, in Europe. Um, the statistics are there. It's quite frightening. There's also evidence that actually spaces that are well-designed can help people retain a sense of self-determination. That has huge impacts in terms of cost of health care and also their quality of life. At a more focused level, there is medically convincing evidence that some spaces can be de designed in such a way that it actually treats Alzheimer's. It doesn't cure it, but it actually treats the symptoms of aggression, depression, etc. And this is published in a medical journal. So you can really make a difference with some of these things if they're orientated in um, the right direction. My own work on schools has focused on primary schools. This is small children who spend all their time in one classroom, effectively. And um, we've been able to strip out the effect of the individuals and identify what effect the spaces had on the variation in learning rates amongst those pupils. And it was something like 25% of the variation was down to differences in the classrooms. Not big differences, actually. Quite small things like the visual complexity and issues like that. So the scale of the impacts are really quite significant. But then if you look in other areas, like offices, say, um, this is a statement from several hundred facilities managers who actually went on a web forum and com compared notes and so on, and what do they say? Um, facilities management currently has no objective way of evidencing the value it brings to business. Well, that's completely debilitating, isn't it? How are facilities management as a discipline going to actually make a difference if they simply don't know what impact they make? And that's not because they haven't been trying, but it does make you think, doesn't it? And something like 46% of us work in offices, by the way, so this is a lot of people are being affected. And then when you actually do some things, like for instance, pursue energy issues, um, you can make things worse for the people in the offices if you're not also measuring the impacts on them. So there are some real tensions in there as well, um, which don't get managed if they're not evidenced. So lots of issues. Um, I'd say there's an overemphasis on what and how at the moment. It could be energized by um, more emphasis on why we're actually doing these things. And that would mean evidence for policymakers and clients which could lead to holistic standards. This would be an interesting idea for me anyway, and I know CSDB has been working on this for some years. This would be standards for spaces rather than for elements of the spaces. Um, and of course, that could lead to exemplary projects to help people in practice. So my last slide is to say that achieving double-digit digit improvements for, let's say, children, let's say, workers, let's say, older people, surely would be a good thing. Um, it would surely mean that the construction industry was vital and valued within the economy, and in my mind, that's the only way in which construction can be seen as being sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And the holistic view uh, comes through there, spaces and learning. Now, our final panel member for this session is Professor Lynn Beasley. Lynn was appointed Chief Scientist of Western Australia in 2006. She was awarded Officer of the Order of Australia in January 2009 and made a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering later that year. That was a big year, Lynn. Um, she's member of the new Technology and Industry Advisory Council to the Western Australian Government um, and in March 2011 was inducted to the inaugural West Australian Women's Hall of Fame. Lynn has served on numerous bodies advising state and federal governments, including advisory boards to the Australian Research Council and the Australian Synchrotron. Please welcome Lynn Beasley. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and let me add my welcome to all those from overseas and interstate who are here today and thank the organisers for an obviously a splendid conference. 
I'm going to take a wider view, and that's a city-wide view, and I'm going to give a perspective from arguably the most isolated city in the world, and that is Perth, Western Australia. To put it in context for you, we have a very small population, 1.8 million of us, but predicted to more than double by 2050, and it's in one third of Australia on the western side. We have a lot of sprawl to deal with, but we also have to deal with the fact that we are a biodiversity hotspot, one of 30 around the world, and as you can see, the only one in Australia. And this adds an extra dimension as we look at how we build our cities and maintain our environment. We have a changing climate. From about the mid-70s, we've experienced a great deal of climate change. It's getting slightly warmer, but it's getting an awful lot drier. And we have to build that into the concept of how our cities work. In fact, we have two desalination plants now in operation already, as well as great public programs to try and change the way we use water. But we really need more change. How we live, how we get around. We want to use less land, have great, a smaller footprint, use less water and less energy. And as we quote here from Peter Newman from our University of Curtin, really any economic and social development should aim not to harm the environment. It's a very big ask, but that's the direction in which we clearly all wish to go. Let me say, and just to pick up the theme of schools, we have the first carbon neutral school in Australia. Only 20 odd buildings have reached this level and here's one that's done it from a school, from a challenged background and it's made an enormous difference. In fact, the single biggest difference was changing the water use in the toilets, but also growing vegetables, solar panels and the like. And this brings me on the theme of energy use. And of course, one way to do it is to use hot springs. And luckily in Perth, we have a very good aquifer system. In fact, we've been named in the top 10 of geothermal cities in the world. We come in at number five, and that's the highest one for aquifer use, as opposed to gaining energy from those volcanic sources. So here are where the sedimentary basins are around the world. They're the ones in white. So maybe your city is within those areas and you might be thinking about using aquifers more, both hot water and cold. And one thing you can do is to use the heat from those aquifers to produce fresh water. And a new system to do so with a 30% increased yield has just been developed in Western Australia. I'd happy to tell you more about it uh, later in the conference. Now what we also do is use the cold water directly. Computers generate a lot of heat, so to keep them cool, and of course think how many we have in all our buildings, one way to do it is to take that cool water from under our feet and pump it through, put it then back into the system about a kilometer away. We're busy building one of the 20 biggest supercomputers in Perth, Western Australia. Primarily, the drive was for radio astronomy as we build the square kilometre array of radio telescopes, sharing that with South Africa. But it's much more broad than that now. But it's great to see we're using a potential source of renewable energy in geothermal. Let me turn to waves too. The blue of the dot there tells you whether your city is an area that has great wave potential, as you can see many areas of the world do. Here are two of the things that are currently being developed in Perth, but I mention particularly the one on the left because not only does it generate power at shore, it also desalinates water. And just think how many cities around the world need to do both water and energy. Let me turn to solar energy. It's great to see that buildings have solar potential, but this building that will be known well to all of you from Britain and many around the world, only about 1.2% to of the energy it needs actually comes from its solar panels. And there's a heck of a lot of glass there we're not using. A development in Perth to try and look at this, I think suggests one of the ways forward. When we look at the light spectrum, there are areas we don't want, the UV and the infrared. But we could convert by special glass with nanotechnology into it those extra pieces of light we don't need and capture them in photovoltaics. Imagine having a building where every window works for you. And that would be the goal. Excellent uh, thermal properties and gaining those solar energies. 
Let's turn to transport, because one of the big things about our cities is that they're clogged up with traffic. And Perth is no exception. Most of us go by car, although public transport is increasingly being used. But what I like to see is as buildings are being put back into the city, we're seeing things like end of trip facilities seen as a key function so people can walk or cycle to work and then get ready for the day in the office. When you look at urban sprawl, this is our vulnerability in Perth to oil price increases and of course it's uh, taken that the further away you are from the city, which is in the middle there, the uh, more expensive it becomes. We can never turn back the clock to become a Copenhagen but do we want cities that look more like LA? And when you look at transport costs, they increase with city area. The aim should be to get those cities right down at the low energy cost by reducing city area. And let me also say, it's not just the big cities. I believe we have to embrace this across the world. An example here is from Geraldton. It's about four hours drive north of Perth. And this is looking at getting long-term sustainability, where we get members of the community together, strong community groups who say what they want and the way they think they can approach it. In this case, the five pillars, culture, environment, social economy, and governance. They've actually won an international award for this, but I think it's something we should be encouraging across the board. For example, should we really be going in for buildings that look like this? It's only by doing more research and development and strong consultation with the community we will know the best way forward. So do we want to go from this? What will be our future? There are lots of ways. I wonder which will be the right one. I'm sure your deliberations here today will help you along that path. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you, uh, panel members. Now, we've got, uh, as planned, 10 minutes to run with questions. Uh, in summary, we've heard uh, from Ian uh, the importance of collaboration and need for investment, reinforced by Carol's uh, uh, leveraging uh, research investment is about uh, providing for a better society. And when uh, Peter talked about um, the need for dissemination, I know that there will be uh, thoughts around the room around the need for research that actually is then communicated to industry and government and makes a difference to policy, planning and practice. And from Lynn, the challenges of an urban uh, growth and urban society reinforcing, I think, some of the CEO of the Property Council's thoughts, Peter Verwer's uh, presentation of yesterday, I think, uh, resonates well. So I'd like to uh, open up in, in uh, my role. I'm, I see myself as a facilitator. Uh, and if there's questions from the floor, uh, if you don't mind um, introducing yourself and affiliation and to whom you'd like to address a question in the panel. Who would like to kick it off? Excellent. And for others, uh, if you don't mind lining up perhaps to save time behind the microphones, that would be terrific. Thank you. Christian Bachmann from Germany and still 57. Um, I have a question to you, Carol, because you like questions, and to you, Peter, because you touched the subject that I'm asking you. Uh, we have here on this list 447 uh, participants. Out of these 447, 323 are from universities, 88 are from research institutes, and 36 are from the industry, or I cannot, I don't know where they are coming from. There are two from construction companies. Uh, we are talking about dissemination. We are talking about impact of re, uh, r and on the construction. How can we do that if we are sitting here by ourselves? We are here in some kind of incestuous environment and uh, the results of incest are typically not something good. <laughs> Carol. Yeah, thank you for your question. <laughs> <laughs> and comment. <laughs> because I think in the question is the answer, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, I think it is important for us as researchers, as, as a scientific community, first to, to meet and, and share good questions. So, <laughs> but you're right, it's not enough. Uh, uh, at the same time, I think uh, what we show here is that we also have the responsibility to share 
questions and answers with other people, the stakeholders of the, this big sector, this big uh, building sector. So today, that's what we do at the national level and also at the European level with the ECTP, which is um, uh, bringing together companies, and there are a lot of companies in the ECTP. And I think uh, maybe we can, we can go one step further, and, and soon, I hope, uh, also it will be interesting for uh, international uh, business to meet at the international level and speak about this issue of innovation and sustainable construction. Peter? Um, yeah, I didn't think I was going to be arguing in favour of incest when I came to this conference. So, um, I think Carol's got the right answer, though. It's, I think, as individuals, when we go back to our own places of work, we're always working with industry, we're always in interacting, we're always trying to influence policy makers, but you can do it with greater confidence and with a wider range of ideas because of events like this. So I personally don't have a problem with it being dominated by researchers. Um, I think it's fulfilling a particular function. It's not fulfilling the function of communicating results to the industry very strongly, um, but it is actually putting us in a position where we can do that better back in our own places. Thank you. Any other comments from Lynn or Ian? No? Well, I, I'd, I'd only say that given that 94% of the industry in Australia is comprised of businesses with five or fewer people, it's not a surprise. Mm. Uh, they're out there doing their job and making money. Um, in a, it's hard to pull people out of uh, organisations that size to sit here for two or three days. Um, but I think the answer is... Uh, the answer that's been given, that you get the confidence from here to go back and talk to those people, either in their workplace or in yours, but, but close to where they are, rather than presume they can stop doing what they're doing uh, in order to come here. Thank you. Lynn? I'd agree with all the other speakers, but I would say I think it's terribly important, particularly as your students are training, and I'm sure you do this, to ensure that they spend as much time with industry as possible, so they not only understand their problems and look to solutions, but they actually understand the language that is used that's sometimes very different between an academic environment and that of a business world. So I, for example, would like to see any... Uh, doctoral students have to write in a thesis at the beginning the translatability of the work they do, put a section on that at the end when they submit it and spend two to three months of their time in their two to three years that they spend doing research on part of that should be spent actually in the real world so that when they uh, leave, whether they stay in academe or move across to business or just become a member of the community, all equally important, they actually are much more street smart than some of our graduates are at present. Perhaps that doesn't apply to this sector, but I certainly think it does to others, and it's a, a good general comment to make, I hope. Thank you. Uh, next question, thank you. Um, Helen Anderson Brands, and um, having been in a role similar to both Lynn and <coughs> Ian in a previous life in New Zealand, uh, I would like to pose a question about how to make construction research sexy. Uh, the challenge for most of us is that we know how important it is, in, it is in terms of GDP and its potential impact, so we know that. But when you rock up and you've got some pretty sexy SKA research or you've got something else on um, new foods or new technology, uh, construction's actually pretty boring by comparison. <coughs> so can you give me a tip, Ian and Lynn, on how to make uh, this field, which we know is important, attractive to politicians? Uh, Lynn can give you the tip and I'll agree with her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the first thing is to ask chief scientists to events like this because I'm certainly learning a lot already and it will be included in the conversations I have and the time I spend not only speaking to politicians but visiting, for example, primary schools. We, I think I'm looking forward to some very interesting conversations on that. So I think one of the things to do is make sure you keep inviting people to conferences like this, but at a, a more serious level, in a way. I, I don't think it is stressed in our universities enough. I think it's there. You can tease it out in various disciplines, but it tends not always. Some universities, of course, do have courses that are specifically in this area, but often because it's so multidisciplinary, it's hard to see, and putting together units where you pull in everyone from the health area right through to 
building a better concrete, I think, would be a very good way forward. This is clearly a growth area, an area where universities should see opportunities. And also, not only to work within the university sector and across the business, but very much with a vocational and education system, because for Australia, for example, <coughs> that's our greatest need in terms of employment, and to make sure that the more technical aspects of those who are going to be out there working in this area are involved in the decision making and making sure that the information is really used when you're out there as part of the workforce. And Helen, I think you've fired Ian up as well. Yeah. So something like in Australia, something to the order of 75% of our researchers are in higher education institutions or uh, research agencies of government. So it's about 75%. That puts us in a relatively... Uh, it, it's not a unique position in the world. We share that uh, proportion with the United Kingdom or with Thailand. Um, but many of the other countries uh, with which we would compare ourselves have uh, something to the order of 50% maybe and probably less generally uh, with 60 or 70% out there in business. One of the reasons uh, that it is uh, said why we are like that is that our um, research training tends to be a self-replicating model, a cloning almost incest but um, uh, but not quite where you you um, there is a mountain of literature which suggests that in our educational processes the professors uh, seek to replicate themselves on the presumption that everybody will end up in a position like theirs and in fact it's only about 15 percent who could so i think what it means is that we don't expose our students really to truly interesting uh, problems that are in the economy as a whole. Um, we don't prepare them with uh, the sorts of things Lynn was talking about earlier, work placements and the like, where they can come to, come to grips with um, what some of the really exciting issues out there uh, mm. are out there in the broader economy. Um, and I think that, um, you know, certainly from my office and and uh, with the support of uh, other governments in Australia, we're, we, we're the federal government is pushing hard to try to make a lot of that educational process more open so that students are given more ideas of opportunities and options that are available to them as, uh, as careers. And it's a long run. I mean, you have to start investing now to get a big change by 10, 15, whatever years, or certainly not one or two days. And, um, but I think we have to do it because it, it reduces innovation. It, it means that some of our most creative minds are not going into parts of the economy where creativity is, uh, is uh, highly desired and, um, and, mm. and very often yeah. would be revolutionary were they to be creative uh, in some of those uh, parts of the economy. So I think we've got a lot of work to do, but I think you have to start basically where the education system believes that it leaves off and what it's preparing people for. Mm. No, it's terrific and I know Carol's been uh, uh, like itching to, to speak as well. Thank you Helen, you've stirred up the sexy uh, pot. Yeah, I'd like to, to give a quick testimonial so uh, we have the same kind of issue of course of how to make attractive our sector and, and I think it echoes exactly what was said by Lynn and, and, and Ian Chubb there, is that um, we're trying to, to change the culture in the fact that we're not doing research for buildings, we're doing research for the people who will live in buildings, and that makes the research much more attractive because people are attractive. Mm. Terrific. And uh, if I could just uh, give a plug for Ian's office, the Office of the Chief Scientist uh, in December last year put out a top breakthrough actions for innovation uh, available on the web. Uh, Ian uh, heads the Prime Minister's Science, Engineering and Innovation Council. Uh, and breakthrough action three is to encourage mobility of researchers between academia and business or other enterprises to help uh, build up, I guess, the, uh, the joint sexiness and uh, the need for collaboration across all of those sectors. Now, I'm uh, looking at this uh, digital clock here that says 10.05. Um, I'm understanding that a good number of our panel um, members will be here through morning tea and some for the rest of the, the day and, uh, and evening. Um, so I'd like to say thank you so much for your contribution from the audience, but particularly from Ian, from Carol, from Peter and from Lynn.
thank you so much for a very stimulating morning's uh, discussions and for your efforts in being here. And I'd like perhaps uh, as an audience to please uh, thank the panel members for their contribution. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.